Today we're going to open the Gospel of John, who's going to lead us into a knowledge of eternity. This is the greatest moment in the history of humanity. But, let's face it, it's a, a frightening time. Wars, armaments, genocide, fear, violence, hatred, a world that has been governed more by economy than by deep human needs. Small groups or culture, ethnic groups are being crushed. And so we're in a, in a world where there is fear because we have the technology, but frequently that technology is at the service of the powerful, of the big ones, of the super, super powers. And then that cement, that which held families together, held people in places of belonging, somewhere that's being broken under the power of individualism, my needs, and we're forgetting frequently about the responsibilities. We're talking more about the individual rights more than individual responsibility. So as soon as it's the individual being pushed forward, then there's selfishness, there's rivalry, there's competition. And then what do we have? We have winners, not too many. Many losers, very many losers, and then a lot of victims. And then our poor earth is being polluted and out of greed is being deeply wounded. So on one side, this incredible possibility, but on the other side, this incredible despair, because from every side, we are looming up death, depression, oppression. And so what is the meaning of human existence, my life, your life? What is the meaning of our life? What is the meaning of our universe? Is it just some crazy farce that has come from nowhere and is going from nowhere? Something that just happened by an accident and they were all just bits of accidents and we're all doomed to death and depression and to become little by little victims? Or is there any hope? What is happening though, and that is something beautiful is that people are beginning to discover spirituality. That maybe it's spirituality that is lacking. Maybe spirituality will maybe help us to live with the pain, help us to, to see that this death and depression, there is a hope there. So what I have discovered, and this is maybe just what I want to share with you, is the incredible spirituality that exists in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is a spirituality that will lead us into a communion with God, the God of peace. Lead us into a knowledge of eternity, to a stillness, to a stillness in the whole link and bonding with eternity and the eternal. Maybe that's what many of us need in this very busy world filled with compulsions, filled with noise, to come to the place of, of stillness and uh, out of peace. So it's a spirituality that is leading us into a knowledge of a God of love, a God of forgiveness, a God of goodness, and at the same time, the God of creation. And this God of creation is not outside of the world, but hidden within the world, present in the world, present in our broken world. So the spirituality of John, with his spirituality of communion with God, is also a spirituality that doesn't run away from reality, but brings us towards reality. That's to say, it brings us towards love, towards compassion. It's not to run away from the brokenness of our world. It's not to run away from what appears as an absence of God, but to become men and women who are presence of God who bring the presence of God into the absence of God, who bring a presence of God into the brokenness and help us to discover, I'd say, the, the mystery that is there of a God hidden in brokenness. You see, this gospel is the gospel of the Word who became flesh. Not the Word which is up there in the skies, not just flesh, which brings us to despair, but the Word who became flesh, the light who entered into the darkness. And so this is the, the, the gospel which helps us to be grounded in reality 
and also for myself in a special way, living with people with disabilities, people who are weak. They have led me into the earth, not out of the earth, but to discover the presence of God within this earth, this broken earth. So we will be entering into a journey of the spirituality of John. It's a very beautiful gospel. It's a gospel quite different to the other gospels. The other gospels give clearly the facts about Jesus, the way he was born, the way he lived, the way he was died, the way he rose from the dead, give clear facts about the, what I'd call the, the vision of Jesus, the message of Jesus, which would be the Beatitudes and the way we are called to love. But this gospel is slightly different. It's really for those who want to go a little bit further a little bit further in a communion with God, a little bit further into the realization that we are called through this gospel to a mystical life, to a spirituality, and that this is a spirituality of peace and of joy and of compassion. So this spirituality of John is, is different to the others and it's leading us on a journey, a very beautiful journey through different stages which we'll gradually discover as we go through this gospel to finally the stages where we lose things, where we enter into weakness and even in that weakness it's the preparation of a new presence of God. So in order to enter into this belovedness with God, the road will be faith. And one of the strange things in this gospel is that faith, the, the, the writer never uses the, word, the noun faith, but he uses the verb to believe in, which could also be changed or translated to trust in. So everything is about a relationship, a relationship between me and Jesus, between you and Jesus, and a relationship which is of trust. And as you know, trust is something that grows. We meet somebody, we discover that the other person is good, they discover that we are good. Trust begins to be born. You have the trust of fiancés or people who are going to get married one for another. The trust much deeper ten years later, and then the trust when they're old people. The trust is something that deepens and grows much deeper. So this is the, the, the gospel of trust. It's the gospel of belief. It's the gospel of believing in somebody who has come to liberate us, to give us a new freedom, to make it, help us to enter into a relationship with God. And as you know, and as I know, trust, which is relationship, has to be nurtured. You see, trust is one of those realities. It either grows, because it can never remain static. If it remains static, it dies. And so it's this trust that is going to bring us into a knowledge of Jesus. But here again, let's be careful. When we say in the Gospel of John to know Jesus, it's not an intellectual knowledge. It's not something that we study. It's not something that comes from books. It's the knowledge of when I say, oh yes, I know that person. I'm, I'm his friend. I'm her friend. So it's a knowledge that comes from meetings because We've begun to love each other, we've begun to trust each other. But this knowledge is something more than faith. It's a deepening where I really begin to know you as a person. And so this belovedness comes through faith and trust, which is going to bring us into a knowledge, which is that knowledge of love. I know you and I love you. And of course this knowledge is something that will grow. You see the whole of the Gospel of John, it's, it's like a spiraling up. We go all the way up and Jesus is in the center. We're getting to know him better. We're being drawn into a mystery. And as we go through the Gospel, it's going up and it's going down. We're getting closer and closer to a presence of Jesus. We're getting to know Jesus better and we're being drawn into the mystery, which is to discover who Jesus is to discover that if we are in communion with him, we're in communion with God. And if we're in communion with him, we're in communion with our brothers and sisters in all of humanity. 
So there's something very special in this in this gospel, which is which is being given to us, and it's a mystery that is for all of us. I said it's for all the seekers of God, but the seekers of God are you and me. We're not people who are in monasteries, though they are important. It's not people who have done big things, who have gone far away to announce the word of God. It's for you and me. That is why that somebody says that this Gospel of John is like a body of water where elephants can swim and children can wade. So what we're going to do is during these days is to go into swimming in the Gospel if we're elephants or wading in the Gospel if we're but children. Andrei Shiraki, who, is the, who was for a long time the deputy mayor of Jerusalem, a very great man, and he translated the whole of the Bible. He translated the Gospel of John, but he translated it in a very special way because he saw that John or the, the, was deeply immersed in the Hebrew culture deeply immersed in the Hebrew language. So he translated this gospel in a way that comes much more from the Hebrew, not just a translation from the Greek. And he says this, he says that a book like the Gospel of John flows from the silence of God, from where and in which we discover the Word of God. And we can only really enter into the word logos. We can only really enter into this gospel if it flows from our own silent contemplation. So what I'm calling you in this, 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 as we go into St. John, is not to see this book as something we're going to study, but it's something that we're going to be called into little by little. And there it'll help us to discover the silence of God, help us to contemplate God, but it'll also bring us ourselves into a whole mystery of contemplation and silence and spirituality. This gospel begins with what we call the prologue. The prologue is incredibly beautiful, poetic, mystical, and in a way it synthesizes maybe the whole of the gospel, but maybe the whole of creation. And uh, it's an incredibly beautiful and it's going to lead us gradually into the whole journey that we're going to take. And it begins with John looking before all things. And if you'll permit me, I'll give rather a free translation. Before all things, the Logos was. The Logos, we can translate it, most people translate it as the Word. But it's more than the Word, it's more than the spoken Word. It's the thought behind the Word. It's more than the thought behind the Word. It's the vision, it's the, the wisdom behind the Word. So even one could use wisdom even instead of, of the Logos or the Word. So it begins with this contemplative vision before all things were, the Logos, the Word, Wisdom, was. And the Logos, Wisdom, was God. And the Logos was turned towards God. It's an incredible vision that the Logos was with God, turned towards God, in communion with God, and the Logos was before all things turned towards God. Here we have the beginning of the Gospel, which is this vision of God before all things, before creation. And we see that before all things, there was communion in God, there was love. It was the word towards God, in the presence of God, in love with God. And then, by the Logos, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made. So it's from this incredible vision of, of God, the Logos and God, both God, one God, but flowing from that creation. And then we're going to see that the Word was life, very strong, that God is life. The Word was life and the life was the light of all people. And the light was shining in the darkness. But the darkness didn't overcome it. Darkness was the absence of God. 
the hatred even that is there in our world. And then the word was in creation and people were able to discover the light of the word within creation, but they didn't always want it. And then the Logos came through the words of holy people, holy people of different cultures in Asia, in North America, in all over the world, in Africa, these wise and holy people. And of course, in a special way to the prophets of, of Israel. But again, we're told that they didn't listen. He came unto his own, the word came unto his own, but his own received him not. But then all those who did receive him, all those that did receive him, all those who received the light of God became children of God and children of the light. So here we have this vast movement. And then, at one particular moment in the history of humanity, something extraordinary happened. In time and in space, the word became flesh. And that word flesh is very strong. It's vulnerable, fragile. It's our mortal humanity. The Word became flesh. So we have this vision of all things came from God. And God became a vulnerable human being who needed us, who needed a woman in whom he could find his own body, who needed a woman who could feed him with her breasts, a woman who could be there to love him and help him to develop, who needed also Joseph, the father, who could then help him to grow and to develop and guide him. So here is the reality that the Word became flesh and pitched his tent amongst us. He became a pilgrim with us. He became our brother. And we discover then that the Word became flesh and John says we have contemplated his glory, that he was full of God that like, like nobody else, and he came to give a, a message of God, and he came to bring us a fullness of love, love upon love. This is why he came. You see, it's very difficult to use words to talk about God. God is the infinite, and all our words are very finite, or very limited. And so when we talk about a relationship between son and father, is God a man, I call him? Of course not. I mean, there's no question of God being man. There's no question of, of God being above. But the whole mystery of God is that he is the source of life. He is the source of men and of women. He is the source of the masculine and the feminine. What is sad is that in the history of humanity, some men have sort of taken it upon themselves thinking that they are the superior ones because God is a father and they don't say God is a mother. But we did say a few minutes ago that God is, that the Son is leading us into the womb of God. And the word kolpos is there, it's the womb, and that is maternal. It's from this innerness of God that life flows and flows into the Son. So I'm just going to have to ask you to be patient with me because now and again I'll have to use a pronoun and I might use the word him. Over the centuries, the Word revealed himself to holy people throughout the world, and in a particular way, obviously, to the Jewish people. And that is why we discover that Jesus is a Jew. His mother is Jewish. All the initial disciples were Jewish. The Jewish people have suffered an immense amount. They've suffered through all forms of oppression and so on. They've suffered also in their history because there were times when they were very faithful to God, times when they were less faithful. And this is the reality of all people in all religions. We as disciples of, of Jesus, we have to become conscious that to become mature Christians, we have to discover and love and admire our heritage. It's rather like human maturity. In order to become a mature human person, we have to claim our past. Because we've come from our parents, the woundedness of our parents, which have created wounds in us. And we cannot become mature unless we've claimed that. And so it is. Christians have to accept, claim, acclaim, forgive, what I'd call all the beauty and all the brokenness in the church. Because that is our history. and We're part of that. 
and in the same way to claim and acclaim our Jewish heritage. We have come from Judaism. So Christianity flows from the Jewish faith and we can be very grateful to our fathers and mothers in that Jewish faith who lived a familiarity with, with God. And, but at the same time, and we know that, some Jewish people rejected Jesus. They had hearts that didn't want to accept the new because they had an incredibly beautiful faith in one God. And they had defended this vision and this faith in front of all the multiplicities of God of other states. And so they were very concerned when Jesus talked about being the son of God. How could God be two? So there was a certain rigidity, there was for, at least in some people. But let's face it, don't criticize the Jews. <laughs> There's so many Christians themselves. We have a name of Jesus. Do we really believe in his message of liberation? Can't we be caught up, and aren't many of us caught up, in the culture of success, power, pleasure, and God knows what? Do we really believe, we, that we can be brought to an inner liberation? And that is the message of Jesus for every person, that we can break down, through Jesus, the walls of hate that separate us and find an inner peace and an inner liberation.